He was a Hakka, which is part of the Han ethnic group, and he was born in Guangdong in 1840. Years of political turbulence in China had resulted in many hardships and very limited opportunities, so many young men migrated to seek their fortune. And Guangdong is the most southerly province of mainland China, and much of the country's trade was channeled through its ports. So it wouldn't have been too difficult for a young man to go down to the docks and negotiate a working passage on one of those many trading ships passing through and just see where that took them. And that's exactly what Chong Fat Si did in 1856 when he was just 16 years old and he ended up in Batavia. Now that's now known as Indonesia, but at this time it was a Dutch colony. Now when he arrived in Batavia, he was penniless, so he just took the first work he could get and he started off working as a water carrier. But that's physically very hard work and of course not very well paid. So he wasn't doing it for long before he was looking for something with better prospects. And next, he managed to get himself a job working as a shop assistant for a paper printer. Now, he worked very hard and he managed to impress his boss. That's always a good idea, isn't it? Now, that helped him a lot. How do you think it helped him? Do you think he got him a pay rise or a promotion? It actually did better than that for him. He ended up marrying the boss's daughter. So straight to the top. Now, you might think that this poor migrant boy from Guangdong would not have seemed like very promising husband prospect, but his boss could see that Chong Fat Si was a hard worker with a lot of determination and a good eye for business. And in fact, it was that boss, who by then was his father-in-law, who later on lent Chong Fat Si the money to set up his own first business. So he really did help him a lot. And Chong Fat Si used the money to set up his own trading company. Quickly, it became very apparent that he had a real skill for spotting opportunities that other people overlooked, and he was a master of diversification. So he traded many different things, such as tea, coffee, tin, rice, pepper, tobacco, even opium, which wasn't illegal at that time. And so his wealth began to grow. And as his wealth grew, he bought himself some ships and set up his own shipping company. And that meant, of course, that he could move all those commodities around without having to pay anybody else to carry them for him. And he could carry other people's commodities alongside his own and earn even more money while he did it. So his wealth grew some more. Then he acquired a bank. And of course, you can guess that helped to make him richer too. Now, years later, when somebody asked him what was the secret of his success, he said to have replied, I pick up what other people give up and I give up what other people pursue quite a simple formula, but if you think about it, quite clever, because it meant he was never having to deal with the pressure of competition. Now, by 1886, he was already quite a wealthy man, and that's when he further expanded his business empire and moved here to Penang. He went on to become one of the wealthiest, most colorful, and politically connected men of his times. He was referred to as China's last Mandarin and first capitalist. He was nicknamed Rockefeller of the East by New York Times. He was appointed Consul General for China, both here in Penang and in Singapore. He served as Special Trade Commissioner for the Empress Dowager of China, and he also helped to establish China's first modern banking system. He was widely regarded as being the wealthiest man in Malaya, with a net worth that was reputed to be around $2.4 billion in today's terms. And to put that into context, in 2020, Forbes estimated Donald Trump's net worth at 2.1 billion. So this poor boy from Guangdong had done very well for himself. But he was also, he wasn't just very wealthy, he was also highly respected. And when he died, so that's the, the restaurant upstairs, someone's obviously moving around up there. When he died in 1916, both the British and Dutch colonial authorities ordered that flags should be flown at half-mast as a mark of respect. So now you know a little bit about the man, let me start telling you about his mansion. This mansion took around six years to build and it was completed in 1904. It has five granite paved courtyards, seven staircases, 38 rooms and 220 windows. I have to say it's not my job to clean those. <laughs> Now, it was built in stages, with the main courtyard and central building being completed first, and then further courtyards were added in wings on either side. 
and the property served both as the family home and as the center for Chong Fatsi's business activities when he was here in Penang. And where we're currently standing is where business was conducted. Now, those of you who are sitting down, I can see a few of you enjoying the furniture here. You've probably started to notice by now that it's not very comfortable, is it? That's exactly as it would have been during Chong Fatsi's times, and it was completely deliberate. It was intended to ensure that when you came here to do business, you didn't feel too relaxed or too at ease. Now, this is the only part of the mansion that most businesses, business visitors would ever see, and it's separated from the rest of the property by this beautiful carved screen. And this served to give privacy to the occupants beyond, and the ladies of the house, but it did allow them to peek through to see who the visitors were, and even listen in to what was going on out here if they chose to, without anybody seeing them. Now, in addition to the building that you see here today, there were stables and other outbuildings at the back of the property. There are some further outbuildings beside the main gate that now house Manga Cafe. And if you look back through the main entrance, on the other side of Lee Street, directly opposite us there, you can see a row of five terraced houses. Those were the staff quarters. So it was a substantial and impressive property, and John Fatsi was very proud of it and he wanted to ensure that it would continue to be the family home for many years to come. In fact, it was his hope that it would house nine generations of Chongs. But you can probably already work out for yourselves, it didn't pan out that way. But who did live here? Well, Chong Fatsi not only had a lot of money, he also had a lot of wives. Does anybody know how many wives Chong Fatsi had? Bear in mind, you didn't have to do them one at a time at this point in history. It was completely acceptable to have more than one wife at once. Anybody want to guess? Five. Did I, did I hear five? He actually did better than five. He obviously really enjoyed female company because he had eight wives in total. And wives number, wives number three, six and seven all lived here in Penang. And this mansion became the home of wife number seven, Tante Po, who was widely known to be his favourite. It was said that he loved her above all others, and in fact, she's the only wife mentioned by name in his will. Now, in his will, there was a clause that stated that the mansion and all of its contents could not be sold until after the death of his youngest son. And as it turned out, the youngest son was born to him by wife number seven, Tante Po. So that all seems fairly tidy and straightforward so far, doesn't it? Except it's probably fair to guess that that last youngest son was a little bit of a surprise addition to the family. Because when he was born, Chong Fatsi was 74 years old. So no prizes for guessing there was a significant age gap between Chong Fatsi and his favorite wife. In fact, when they married, he was 70, and she was just 20 years old. Wow. Now, when he died, that youngest son was only two years old. He was just a little toddler. And that little boy went on to live into his mid-70s, which meant that the rest of the family all had a very long wait to receive their inheritance. <laughs> but of course, Chong Fatsi was no fool, and he knew that if his family were going to be able to live here in comfort and maintain his precious mansion, they would need money. So his will had also established a trust fund, and the trust fund bequeathed 250 straight settlement dollars per month to defray the cost of upkeep and pay servants' wages. They couldn't use that money for anything else. It was just to look after the mansion. Now, that was a very generous amount of money. At that time, that's more than many people would have earned in a whole year. But with the advent of World War II, when Malaya was occupied by the Japanese, sadly, the banking system collapsed and the currency was drastically devalued and those 250 straight settlement dollars per month ended up becoming more like 250 ringgits per month, which, of course, nowhere near enough to maintain the mansion. So bit by bit, the mansion began to fall into disrepair and as it became less comfortable to live in one by one, the family moved out, eventually just leaving the youngest son and his wife, the last daughter-in-law, to live here and try to maintain it. And that last daughter-in-law was appointed as caretaker by the trustees. And after struggling for years, she eventually felt she had no option but to start taking in tenants to try and generate some income to help maintain the mansion. By the time her husband, the youngest son, died in 1989, which meant that the mansion could then be sold, 
It was in a very sorry state. Individual rooms had been rented out, not just to single tenants, but to entire families. The larger rooms had been subdivided so that more tenants could be accommodated, and even corridors and passageways had been partitioned off and those were occupied too. When the new owners bought the mansion at auction, it didn't come with vacant possession. It came with 34 families still in residence, and it took over a year and quite a bit of financial encouragement to get them all to move out. And while dealing with all those tenants, there was the building itself that was also desperately in need of attention. No maintenance had ever been carried out on the roof, so of course that was leaking badly and causing damage right through the property. Um, tenants had been cooking on open fires inside the property, um, not just on the granite floors and the tiled floors, but even on the timber floors upstairs. They'd put up washing lines by tying one end of a rope to something such as the, the fragile carvings of the panel here, and then sling the rope across the hallway and tie the other end to the fragile frame of the stained glass windows. Um, the main gate was falling down completely. There was no proper electricity installation. Tenants were simply connecting a cable to the main supply out in the street and then trailing the cable through until it reached wherever they wanted the power. Once again, using things like light fittings and the panels, the carved panels, to support the cable along its path. And perhaps the most shocking problem of all, there was no indoor plumbing. At the time the mansion was built, it would have been completely normal to use outhouses in combination with chamber pots. And for a wealthy family such as this one, lots of servants to empty and clean those for you. By the time properties were starting to install modern plumbing, the mansion's family owners had already fallen on hard times and they simply hadn't had the money to do it. So I think it's fair to say there was a lot to do. But from the very beginning, authenticity was the driving principle for the new owners. Now, the restoration work took six and a half years to complete. That's longer than it took to originally build the mansion. And for obvious health and safety reasons, it was deemed necessary to completely rewire the property and to install modern plumbing. But apart from those two exceptions, original features and original materials have been retained wherever possible. Now, that furniture that I referred to earlier on, sadly, that is not the original, because the contents of the mansion had all been auctioned off at separate auctions that were held before the mansion itself was put up for auction. But it is absolutely contemporary to the period and of the style that would have been here during Chong Fat Si's times. However, if you look down, these floor tiles that we're all standing on are the originals. These were imported from Stoke-on-Trent in Staffordshire in England, and they're what is known as encaustic tiles. They're very high quality, and the pattern that you see there is not painted onto the surface. It's created using different colors of clay, which means that that pattern runs through the full thickness of the tile, and it won't wear off as the tile wears down. And I think we can probably all agree it's testament to their quality that they still look as good as they do today after 120 odd years of sometimes very heavy wear and tear. Now, I'm shortly going to invite you to follow me through to the main courtyard, which is just the other side of the panel here. But before we go, I'll tell you a little bit about the restoration of this screen. As you heard me say earlier, it had been very badly used and abused by all those tenants treating it as a clothes prop. But it has also been, it was absolutely thick with dust, dirt and grime of many, many years of neglect. And it wasn't just the sort of fluffy dust that you could flick off with a feather duster. With all that open fire cooking going on inside the property, that puts a lot of oil in the air. And when that settles on things, they become slightly sticky and the dust really builds up. And especially with all this fine carving, it was just completely clogged up and in a really revolting state. It's been painstakingly restored to the condition that you see today. And the gold color that you see there, that's not gold paint. That's the original gold leaf. And it's all been cleaned up using tiny little cotton buds dipped in special cleaning solution. To give you an idea of the scale of the task, each of the small panels here took on average 26 hours to clean. Now, I think that gives you a very good idea of the lengths that the new owners were prepared to go to in order to restore the original beauty of the mansion and breathe new life back into it. For them, this was never about just quickly fixing the place up, making it look nice again, or just getting it to a point where it could be useful again. It was all about restoration of the original beauty. Something else that would have um, helped to dictate many decisions about the mansion's structure and design is feng shui. 
Now, I expect everybody's heard of Feng Shui, but in case any of you are not familiar with the details, it's an ancient philosophy that divides the world into five elements of earth, water, fire, timber, and metal. And the belief is that if you want to have harmony and balance in your life, then you need to be surrounded by the right balance of those elements. So before any construction work began, Chong Fat Si would have used the services of a feng shui expert, and he would have surveyed the plot of land using a thing called a lupan, which is a kind of specialist feng shui compass. And one of the things he would have been looking for was where he could detect the strongest and most auspicious qi, or energy. And that determined where the center of the mansion was going to go. Now, some people are more sensitive to qi than others, but I'm told that those who are sensitive to qi can still feel that energy to this day. Now, the mansion is completely symmetrical in its layout and design to ensure that that spot was at the very heart of the property, and that's right here in the middle of the main courtyard. And if any of you want to try it for yourselves at the end of the tour, please feel free to come back, stand between the two plant tubs, and see if you can tune into it. Especially if anybody here is a qigong practitioner, for example, you may find you can tune into it. So having worked out where the middle of the mansion was going to go, another decision would have been which way was it going to face? Now you might think, well, the address is Leith Street, so surely it just faces the street, straightforward, surely. But no, because according to Feng Shui, the most desirable aspect for a property is for it to lie off the dragon's back. And to do that, it must meet three conditions. The first condition is for it to face the sea. And of course, in Georgetown, that's very easily achieved. So we can just put a tick in that box, look at condition number two. Condition number two is it must have hills behind the property for protection. And that has actually determined the position of the property on the plot of land. When you're leaving, if you remember to take a look, you'll realize that the front elevation of the mansion actually does not sit parallel with Leith Street. It's offset at a rather strange angle. And that was because by doing that, at the time of construction, you would have been able to look through the back and see in the distance Penang Hill, or Bukit Bendra, as it's known locally. Of course, these days, unfortunately, there's too many taller buildings have been constructed, so you can't see the hills anymore, but they're there. So we've satisfied the first two conditions. There's just one left to deal with, and this one was a little bit harder. The third condition is that you must build on a slope. But Georgetown is completely flat. So what do you do about that one? Well, there's a bit of architectural trickery has been used. If you look at the front edge of the courtyard, you'll see there are two steps coming down into the courtyard. And then here at the back, there were three. Buy two, get one free. <laughs> in fact, the whole of the back of the mansion has been elevated by that 11 inches. That's around 28 centimeters. In order to give the impression that it's been built on a slope. Now, another very important feng shui element is this open air well. This is designed to take advantage of nature's well. So it allows light to enter, it allows air to circulate, and it allows water to enter. Now, I don't know about all of you guys, but I spent most of my life living in a cold northern hemisphere climate where homeowners go to a lot of trouble and expense to make sure the rainwater doesn't come into their homes. So when I first heard about this, it seemed very strange to me. But to the Chinese, water represents wealth. So rain is literally like pennies from heaven. And you'll see this feature in many of the heritage properties around Georgetown, where an open air well draws the rain in and then catches it in a sunken courtyard directly beneath. Because if you want to be wealthy, it's no good just having money coming in. You also need to hold that money for a little while, and you need to make sure that it's leaving your hands more slowly than it's coming in. So these are not designed to fill up and become like a pool or a pond, because still water is not good for you. They're just designed to hold the water for a short time and then allow it to disperse slowly. So as I say, this is not an uncommon feature. You'll see it in many places. But Chong Fat Si went a whole lot further to make sure he took full advantage of those pennies from heaven. This mansion actually has a system of gutters and hidden pipework that collects the rainwater from the roof. It then circulates it all around the upper floor, which helps to cool the rooms upstairs, and then brings it down to this level through huge copper pipes that are buried in the walls. It then flows into the courtyard. There's one outlet just behind your dress there. Thank you. And at that point, it's a two-tier pipe system. There's another one in the far corner over there, but that one's hidden by the plant pots. So it's a two-tier system, and the water comes in through the upper tier, and when there's a certain amount of water in here, it starts to flow back out again. But even then, it wasn't allowed to leave the building. From this courtyard, it's 
directed into the side wings and it's circulated around the courtyards there before it's finally allowed to flow away. And in order to accomplish all of that, the walls on either side of this courtyard area are 17 inches thick. That's about 43 centimetres. In order to accommodate the enormous pipes that were necessary to carry the volume of water that we get during a heavy rainfall. Now, in the four corners of this courtyard, you'll see eight cast iron pillars. These were made by McFarlane and Co. of Glasgow in Scotland, where their foundries were making the finest ironwork of the day. And in fact, McFarlane's was particularly known for their ornamental ironwork. You can see their name in Boston if you want to look for it later. Now, these pillars are standing on what's known as the four points of gold, because at the time of construction, Gold was actually buried in the foundations in the location of these pillars to ensure the lasting prosperity of the mansion and its occupants. Not only do these pillars support the upper floor, but they help to satisfy the feng shui requirement for the element of metal. Now if you look up at the top of the columns, you'll see some of the lovely ornamental work that McFarlane's was so well known for. And then resting on the top, you've got some very sturdy looking timber beams. In fact, those are not timber beams at all. Those are iron I-beams that have been encased and then the outer surface of the casing has been painted to look like timber. This would have been in order to get that balance right between the elements of metal and timber. Now another very strong feature of the mansion, of course, is the windows. I've mentioned earlier on, there are rather a lot of them, 220, but they're not all the same style. When you look around, you'll see some that are actually quite plain. They've got sturdy, chunky-looking wooden frames and an arched shape. And some of them have a rounded arch, and some of them have a kind of a pointed arch, like so. Both of those styles are very typical of an architectural style that was known as Gothic Revival. And that was popular throughout Queen Victoria's reign. And of course, she was the ruling monarch at the time this mansion was built. So that would have been a very traditional choice. But then in wonderful contrast with those, you've got the Art Nouveau stained glass windows. Those would have been absolutely cutting edge at the time this mansion was built. The Art Nouveau movement only really began in the closing decade of the 19th century. And to begin with, it was just a small movement with the artists themselves experimenting with a new form of artistic expression. It only really caught the imagination of the general public when it was showcased by some of the exhibitors at the Paris World Fair in 1900. And one of those exhibitors was a gentleman whose name I'm sure you're all familiar with, Tiffany. He actually showed the public for the very first time his brand new style of Art Nouveau stained glass work. Now, this mansion was already under construction in 1900, so presumably the original plan had some other style of window. And we don't know whether Chong Fatsi went to the World Fair himself, or perhaps his architect went, and then came back to Malaysia with news of this wonderful glasswork that he'd seen. But one way or another, Chong Fatsi got to hear about it and decided he wanted that for his mansion. And how lovely that he did. Now, I'm sure everybody here has seen Art Nouveau before, and you've probably even seen Art Nouveau stained glass before, but they're still quite eye-catching, aren't they? So you imagine when this mansion was first built, they really would have turned a few heads. So you should by now be getting the picture that this mansion is a real mixture of things. It has Chinese influences and British influences. It has traditional and it has modern. But the one thing that is run, the common thread that's running through all of those things is quality. With Chong Fatsi's rising wealth and political status, he really wanted this mansion to make a statement and show the world that this property belong, belonged to a man of means and somebody to be reckoned with. And I think he did that pretty successfully, didn't he? That title of Mandarin that I referred to earlier, China's last Mandarin, Mandarin was a title that was conferred on top-ranking public officials in the Chinese Empire, and it only applied to the very highest ranks. But this is a man with a foot in both worlds. When he was in Asia, he would dress in traditional Chinese style his whole life, but when he traveled to Europe, he would dress in European clothing and did it with apparent style. He also maintained that Chinese hairstyle his whole life of wearing his hair in a long plait called a queue that would just hang straight down the back. That was actually something that was first demanded of all Chinese males by the first Manchu emperor in 1645. And that continued right through until the dynasty was overthrown in 1911. It was a sign of submission and loyalty to the emperor. And the penalty for non-compliance was execution. 
So it was obviously very important that if Chong Fatsi wanted to go back and visit family or pursue business interests in China, it was important he had that hairstyle. But when he travelled to Europe, he would just tuck the plait down the back of his jacket so that he didn't draw too many stares, because people would have thought men having a long plait of hair was quite a strange thing to see. Now, you've been hearing he was a great businessman and entrepreneur, but he was also a great philanthropist, and he gave very generously to many different causes, but some local examples of that are he helped to establish the first Chinese-speaking school um, in Southeast Asia here in Penang. It's called the Chunghua Confucian School, and that's still running to this day. And he was also one of the main donors to the Kek Lok Si Buddhist Temple here in Penang. This image here is of an almost life-size statue that they have of him at the temple. Um, so obviously a very devout man too, and actually in his will it said that if any of his heirs should convert to a different faith, they'll be disinherited. So again, very traditionalist, very devout, but he recognized the importance of being open to new ideas, and he looked to the West for modernization and progress. He gave his sons a Western education so that they would be able to communicate with confidence and ease, not only with the foreign world, but also with the colonial rulers that were here at the time. Malaysian history books actually don't make any mention of Chong Fai Si, but if you go to China, he's been honoured as recently as 2005 with special postage stamps, and there was a, there's an image down at the bottom here of the first day cover for those. Now the next panel here shows various pictures of the family at the mansion during the good times, when the mansion was still a lovely, comfortable place to live and well looked after. Once again, you can see in these photographs a mixture of influences with Western and Chinese fashion styles, but you can see that it was a very comfortable lifestyle that they had. There's a lovely picture of one young lady at the helm of a yacht here. And this is my personal favorite. This is the wife of the youngest son and a rather the, sitting behind the steering wheel of a rather flashy looking MG sports car driving up the driveway to the mansion. So obviously a very nice lifestyle they had at this point in history. The lady down at the bottom, this is Tan Te Po, wife number seven. So you, now you know who he fell in love with. Now, the panel in the corner here is actually a sketch of the plan and elevation, the layout of the mansion. And I would suggest, if you're particularly interested in this, come back and look at it at the end of the tour, because there's a lot of small detail there, and it really doesn't lend itself easily to being viewed by a large group. The next three panels are showing you information about the restoration. And the first one asks, it has some photographs of what the mansion looked like when it was bought at auction. Um, I think... <laughs> The owners were very brave people to, to actually buy it at all. You look at the state it was in, um, you can see, I was describing some of it for you earlier on, but there's nothing quite like a few pictures. You can see there's just clutter and rubbish everywhere. The blue colour on the walls was barely even visible anymore. And all this mosaic work that runs around the edge of the roof line and down the gable end walls was in very, very poor state of repair. The ironwork was rusting and broken. There was an awful lot that had to be done. When he came to doing the repair of the mosaic work, um, he's actually done with the help of these little bowls. And you'll see some of these dotted around the mansion as you follow me around. This mosaic work is um, it's known as xian yen, which means cut and paste. And it's an ancient Chinese craft, um, and it's normally the preserve of palaces and temples. You don't generally see a large quantity of it on a domestic building. But the, the artists actually get that three-dimensional effect to the mosaics because they don't use flat tiles, they use little pieces snipped from these bowls. So if they're doing something like the scales of a dragon that have a gentle curve to it, they would just snip a piece from close to the rim of the bowl. And if they're doing something like a flower bud where they want a tighter curve, then they'll snip a piece from close to the base where it's got a steeper curve. When it came to doing the repair work on the uh, mosaics, there were no local artisans that could do this work. And in fact, even in China, it's a dying craft. But the new owners went to China and they managed to find some elderly craftsmen and they persuaded them to come here to do the repair work. And it actually took 10,000 of these bowls to complete the repair work. And there's a funny story that goes along with these little bowls. When you first look at these, they just look like ordinary little rice bowls, but there's a couple of unusual features. First of all, there's no pattern or design on them. They're just plain colours. They've been painted to the colours the artists want and then fired at very high temperature to make sure that colour won't fade. But there's nothing like a flower or a dragon on there, which you'd normally find some kind of design on a Chinese rice bowl. But also, if you look inside them, this is just the raw clay. They haven't been glazed because these haven't ever been made with the intention of using them for food, they've been made specifically for the mosaic work. 
But when the first shipment of these arrived from China, they got held up by the customs officers who wanted to charge customs duty on them as imported tableware. And the new owners explained to them, actually, no, it's not even suitable for tableware because it's not glazed. They explained what they were going to be using them for and said, it's really, it's, it's raw building materials. And the customs officers listened to the explanation and said, mm, no, it's imported tableware. You've got to pay the duty. So the argument went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And in the end, the owners felt, well, it's just holding up the work if we don't pay the duty to get the bowls released. So they paid the duty and the, the work began. But when they shipped some more bowls later on, they made sure they were all broken before they came so that they wouldn't have to pay the duty again. I always like a story where the tax man doesn't get the last word. But this last panel on the end here shows you a detail of the roof. And actually, even these roof tiles was an unusual choice for a domestic property. If you look around the uh, roof lines around Georgetown, those that still have their original roof, you'll normally see that the tiles have a curved tile going over and then an identically shaped one coming under. And then it just repeats and repeats with them interlocking like so, and it creates a kind of wavy zigzag look. This style with the flat tile running through the middle, you'll see on temples or palaces. You don't generally see it on a domestic property. So even with his choice of roof tile, John Fatsi was broadcasting the fact that this mansion belonged to somebody of significance. The work that's been carried out at the mansion to restore it has been described by the new owners as treading lightly and touching softly. They, wherever possible, they used traditional methods and traditional materials to do the repair work. When something was so badly damaged that it had to be replaced, they would always look to see if they could use a part of that item somewhere else in the project and recycle it in that way. And when they had to buy new materials, they would always go first to the salvage yards to see if there was anything from one of the other heritage buildings that had been destroyed or demolished and buy that so that they were bringing in materials that were contemporary to the original. They would use local craftsmen wherever possible. Um, the work that was carried out here, there were no go guidelines or rules for what you could do. The, if they'd wanted to, they could have demolished the building and built something new. They could have gutted it and put in a modern interior. They were really making their own rules as they went along. And in the year 2000, they actually were awarded UNESCO's highest award of most excellent project. And they really became a driving force behind the application that eventually resulted in the UNESCO World Heritage Listing that was awarded in 2008 after 11 years of effort. It also helped to raise conservation awareness and buy time for other people to recognize what could be done with these heritage properties. At the time the mansion was purchased, nobody really appreciated them. They thought the new owners were crazy for even wanting to buy the mansion and do something with it. They couldn't understand what it could be used for. It was just an old building that had had its day and didn't really fit into the modern lifestyle anymore. But as the mansion started to emerge and become something that could be viable again, people started to realize that actually there could be some value in preserving this heritage, these beautiful buildings. And it also helped to educate people as to how to go about that for their own restoration projects and set some benchmarks and guidelines for that work. So I think it's fair to say that the work carried out here helped to save many properties from the wrecking ball, not just this one. Now, in the corner here on this panel, we've got a copy of an extract of Chong Fatsi's will. And again, if you're interested to come back and look at this at the end of the tour, please feel free to do so. The most interesting page is the one down at the bottom, which is just a single page codicil that was added to Chong Fatsi's will just a few months before he died. And it's possibly thanks to that single page document that we are all here today. In that one page, he disinherited one of his sons and he named his youngest son. Now, we don't know what that other son did to deserve being disinherited. It must have been something pretty bad, I guess. But the naming of the youngest son is possibly what saved the mansion. Because if you remember, there was that clause that stated that the mansion couldn't be sold until after the death of the youngest son. And it's possible that if the youngest son hadn't been named in that codicil, the family may have been able to argue that that condition only applied to the sons who were named in the document. The other sons were all quite a bit older. So that would have resulted in the mansion coming up for sale much sooner. And the current owners would not have been here or in a position to buy it and rescue it. So when I was talking about all that Feng Shui earlier on, about 
all the measures that were taken to preserve the lasting prosperity of the mansion, you may have been thinking to yourselves, well, it obviously didn't work, did it? Because the mansion fell on hard times. But maybe it did work. Maybe it was thanks to all that feng shui that the mansion survived for just long enough that the right person was here at the right time to buy it and rescue it for us all. Of course, you can all make your own minds up on that one. We'll never know the right answer, will we? But it's an interesting one. So Tai Po in Guangdong province is where Chong Fai Si was born. And it's where he was eventually returned to be buried. And I use the word eventually because it wasn't entirely straightforward. Chong Fai Si had actually been on a sea voyage to America and Europe. And on the return leg of that voyage, it was very cold at sea. And he got pneumonia. And he died shortly after arriving back in Batavia. But as you've been hearing, he had family and business interests and wives dotted around all over the place. And he was a very important and much loved man. So everybody wanted to show their respects. But it simply wasn't possible or practical for everybody to go to Batavia. So the solution that was found was that his body was embalmed. And after everyone had shown their respects in Batavia, his body was brought here to Penang. And then from Penang, he was taken to Singapore. From Singapore, he was taken to Hong Kong. <laughs> and then from Hong Kong, he was taken to Taipu, where the poor man was finally allowed to rest. Now, we've got some images here of some other properties that belong to Chong Fai Si. The one here was, is his family home in Taipu. He, the family were actually dispossessed of this one during the Cultural Revolution, and it, it, it's still in government hands. You can see it's quite a large property, but it's very plain compared to this one. Once again, it has hills behind it for protection, so he clearly believed very strongly in his feng shui. Um, the one down at the bottom here is interesting. This is his property in Medan, Sumatra, and it has some very strong similarities with this mansion, but it also has some significant differences. So the actual layout of it is identical. We've got a central building, and then there are wings on either side. And both that mansion there and the one here, the five courtyards, which is quite unusual. There are only two known examples outside of China with five granite courtyards, and they both belong to Chong Fai Si. But that's where the similarity ends, because this mansion is a mixture of Chinese and British influences, but the one in Sumatra is actually a, a mixture of Chinese and Dutch influences, because they were the colonial rulers there at the time, and he obviously enjoyed embracing the local culture and showing that he was very much a part of it. Now the next panel, we have some pictures of Chang Yu Wine. Where does that fit into the story? Well, I mentioned earlier on, Chong Fai Si was a master of diversification. And this is another example of that. Chinese wine is traditionally a rice-based drink. But in the course of his travels, Chong Fai Si had tasted grape-based wine, and he rather liked it. Now for most of us, that would mean you buy a few bottles and take it home with you, but that wasn't good enough for Chong Fai Si. He decided he was going to set up his own winery. So with the help of winemaking experts from America and Europe, he had them survey many different areas of China to work out where was the best location in terms of soil type and climate. And having found where he was going to have his winery, they then imported around 300,000 vine cuttings and began set up Chang Yu Winery. Now, to begin with, it was the only grape-based winery in China, but even to this day, it's still in operation. It's the largest one in China, and it's actually one of the 10 largest grape-based wineries in the world. Has anybody here ever tasted Chang Yu wine? No, it's very rare to find someone that has, because they don't seem to export it very often. It's, I believe, very good stuff, but it's won quite a few international awards, but the only people I come across that say they have tasted it, they've tasted it when they were in China. Now there's another gentleman up in the top right hand corner whose face some of you may recognize. This is Sun Yat-sen, who of course went on to become the first president of the Republic of China. He was a fellow hacker, and when he was planning the revolution, he visited various outposts around Asia where there were Chinese settlements seeking funding for the revolution. And he actually spent a significant amount of time in Penang, and he met with Chong Fat Si on a number of occasions. Years later, he actually paid a visit to Chang Yu Winery and he wrote a commemorative plaque, and that still hangs there to this day. It was also when Chong Fat Si died, Sun Yat sen ordered that Chong Fat Si's biography should be researched and written down, and those records are held in the National Archive in Beijing. So there was clearly a lot of respect between these two men, and I think it would be reasonable guess 
that Chong Fat Si was probably a fairly generous donor to the revolutionary funds, although of course we would never know that for sure because records wouldn't have been kept. But when the new owners started doing repair work on the roof, up in the attic space they found some long forgotten trunks. And inside those trunks are the items that you see on display in this room today. Now they were in horrible condition, they're still not fantastic, but they've been restored as much as possible. And even though they're not in great condition, I think they're still good enough that you can see looking at those fabrics and the craftsmanship of those garments, they were, would have been absolutely exquisite. I mean, they, if any of you are seamstresses or tailors, the size of the stitching on those garments is quite remarkable. Now, when the mansion was sold, the wife of the youngest son was still alive, and she met on a number of occasions with the new owners, and partly through her own memories and partly from looking at her private photograph collection, she was able to confirm that these garments had all belonged either to her or to Tan Tay Po, wife number seven. And the ones that were Tan Tay Po's are the ones that are inside these little boxes at the front. Now, the panel in the middle there, you've got two images of Tan Tay Po. The one on the left is her, and then the one on the right is actually a Singapore, Singaporean actress who played the role of wife number seven in a play that was written about her life. And then it was performed here at the mansion in 2011 as part of the Georgetown Festival um, events. I wasn't personally here to see it, sadly, but I think it must have been very moving to see the, her story being told with a lady that looked so much like her moving around the mansion once again. You can also see there a little copy of a newspaper clipping that talks about her funeral. She didn't live to a great age. She lived in, uh, died in her mid-40s. That newspaper clipping can be a little bit confusing because it describes it as saying, it says, wife of, and then it follows by saying, and then it doesn't say John Fancy. But that's not because she remarried, it's actually because that's Chong Fatsi's name in a different Chinese dialect. So I believe that's his Hokkien name, whereas Chong Fatsi would be his Hokkien name. And then down at the end of the room, there's another panel showing photographs of um, some of the Chong Fatsi um, children, uh, sort of way, at the mansion. The top, up in the top left-hand corner is the youngest son, his wife. And then in amongst the pictures of the children, you've also got some pictures of, pictures of ladies wearing these little black and white outfits. The ones on the stand in the corner. They actually would be known as palmas or amaji or famous. And these ladies became known collectively as the black and whites because they always wore these little black and white uniforms. Many of them came from Guangdong as did John Fatsi, and they were actually a very interesting, it's almost like having a little peep into a, a piece of history that's gone, um, social history. These ladies um, they talked amongst themselves and they realized that they didn't want to just marry into a loveless marriage and spend their whole life being um, subservient to their husband's family. They wanted to have a life where they could have financial independence through paid employment. But there were no opportunities for them to achieve that at that time. But these girls got together and talking amongst themselves, they came up with a plan. And they basically set up a kind of a sisterhood and they created their own rules and codes and very morally upright and strict rules. They swore to a life of celibacy and then they traveled out throughout Asia and other corners of the world to working for wealthy families, helping in the household and largely helping to raise the children. Um, a wealthy family would typically have at least one armor per child and they would help with other duties such as cooking and cleaning when they weren't busy with the children but they would have been responsible for all aspects of the child's care. Um, making sure they were dressed and fed and doing their homework or whatever else. And they really would have formed very close bonds with the family. They typically worked for one family for their entire life. They would send their money back to China for their families back there, but they kept a very small portion of it back. But they didn't use that money just for little treats and trinkets for themselves. They put it into a sisterhood fund. And when there was enough money in the fund, they would use it to uh, either rent or purchase a small property that became a sisterhood house. So that if any of their number should become too frail to work, or if some tragedy befell the family that employed them, as sometimes happened back in these days, some, uh, an illness could wipe out a family. And that would have left these girls homeless and unemployed in, in a single sw fell swoop. So they set up these sisterhood houses so that there was a safe place for these girls to go to if tragedy befell them like that. But most of the time, they continued to work for the family their entire lives. When the children were grown up, they'd start helping with the grandchildren. And even when they became too old to really be much use for that, the families would continue to support them. Really, sort of just an interesting, as I say, a little snapshot into social history of the past, because we don't have the same arrangements anymore, do we?